Can you hear me, Mary? It's delayed. Okay. There's a 30 second delay, so we're testing the connection. I've never actually done this before. <laughs> so, technical difficulties. Uh, if, you've, if you're there, I have no way of knowing if you are, I guess, but uh, there's a Q&A app that you can click on and put some questions in there. Uh, it looks like there's already some questions in there from Nikhil, which is good. He said he was going to leave some. Uh, if you've got any, put them in there. Can you hear me there? Just got it. Got it. Okay, so apparently that's the 30-second delay, so now it's Mary can hear me. Uh, so there's that. There's also a chat. Uh, I can't look at the questions and the chat at the same time, so uh, we'll see how that works out. Can you hear me okay, Mary? Okay. Is the AC too loud? Cool. Okay. So uh, I guess I'll get started with the questions. Uh, this will go up on YouTube later on, theoretically, automatically. And if it does, uh, you'll be able to see all of this, including, uh, you know, this. All right, so uh, the first question I got on here from Nikhil is, I thought I'd start with something Ratchet related. On a typical level, how many people form the core group responsible for the design of a level? I'm talking layout, flow, and storytelling elements specifically. So. If we're thinking about a Ratchet and Clank type game, um, back on the PlayStation 2, uh, for it would usually be one designer uh, designing the layout of the whole level. And uh, they'd usually be given a broad story outline, which was designed uh, by the design director, the writers, uh, those sorts of people. And so what you get is, OK, Ratchet is coming into this level for this reason. There's going to be three gameplay segments. One of them's going to be combat, one of them's going to be a swing shot, and one of them's going to be an arena, right? So you know that information about your level going in, but you, uh, at the very least on the PlayStation 2 ratchets, you got a pretty big leash as far as what the specifics of that were. For example, uh, when I did the snow level in Ratchet 3, I got to decide what all the enemies were. And since that level ended up being Captain Quark's secret fortress, I made sure that they were all things that would appeal to his vanity, right? And that was something I got to decide on. Uh, as far as how they looked, though, the design of how they looked, that was a completely separate group of people uh, who, would, who would do that sort of thing. As far as uh, layout and flow, that was usually the sole um, responsibility of the designer who was working on that level. Uh, so you would you would come up with, so we'd have about four, maybe five weeks to do this. And during the first week, you'd come up with something really simple, like a text document or just a little diagram with bubbles, with lines connecting them that sort of say, all right, so we're going to start up up here. Then there's going to be these enemies. And then there's going to be these swing shots. And then you go over here. And then if the player goes the other way, they can get to the arena, and then there's a cab back at the end, that sort of stuff. So usually that was one person that would then get reviewed by the entire rest of the team. Every Friday we'd have meetings, and we would all get into a room, and you'd show whatever you had. If it was a, a, an actual prototype that you could walk through, like a block level, they would do that. Uh, if it was a map, we'd look at the map, and we'd all give uh, uh, critiques and stuff that we thought they could improve it. And then when the next week would come, we'd all look at it again. So every Friday was sort of a everybody checks in with each other and makes sure that they're not absolutely insane. And then also make sure that everything that they're working on is, is sort of cohesive from level to level. So our design director, his job is to make sure that uh, even though all of us get our, our own individual levels, that what we're doing in there fits into the larger process. Uh, Let's see. So following from that, how has the scale of games over the past generation and leading into this gen affected sizes of design teams? Do you have more people providing input on each level now than ever before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, so when I was working on the PlayStation 2, for Ratchet 1, we had three designers. Uh, and then I was a junior designer. Uh, on Ratchet 2, we had, I think, two extra designers on top of that. So we had five or six people during the course of the team. 
then by Ratchet 3, it was about eight, and it just kept expanding over time. And now, with games the way they are being so huge, you need much larger teams. Like on um, Skylanders, they had two design teams, one for the, the team designing the actual Skylander monsters, and another for the people designing the levels and content and stuff like that. Uh, you know, they, they would even have smaller teams for like, this is the team working on player versus player, as opposed to the team working on, uh, you know, expansion packs and stuff like that. So nowadays it's much, much more specialized. Uh, you might see uh, designers who are responsible for just the economy in the game, right? Uh, another designer who might be responsible for, you know, designing each of the characters and their dialogue, or, or there might be a whole team for that. So it really is a lot bigger. Uh, compared to our Ratchet design team of about, uh, let's say, an average of five people, uh, and, may, and all of them were, were generalists, right? We'd have people who would work on a level and work on the arena, you know, and work on, say, one of the gadgets. And that would be their responsibility for the entire game. You know, they have a few levels, a gadget, and a major feature, and they would do all of that. But nowadays, there would be a designer for the arena, a designer for the specific gadgets. A design they would all be very specialized. Uh, and it's not the case like that in every company. The smaller the company gets, the more generalized the designers are. But nowadays, there are more people providing input for each specific thing that goes into a game. Uh, and I mean, you can, you can even extract that outwards. Now, most publishers have design teams also. Uh, at Activision, I was on the publisher's design team uh, and what we would do is, is we would go into, we would, we would fly into a developer and we would tell them what the publisher was thinking and try to get that to match up with what they wanted to do. So in a way it was, you know, the, the, the executives and producers and, and, and people working at the publisher who also want to make the game good, have a lot of feedback and ideas and the design teams at the publisher usually sort of communicate that and how how that can be done with, you know, while simultaneously getting what they want into the game. So there's a, a whole lot more people than there used to be because making a game is a lot more complicated. Uh, I mean, back then, you know, there were, it was like eight million, five million, eight million dollars to make a game or something. And uh, I mean, for, for some games. And now, you know, you're, you're spending $30 million or something to make a game. It's, it's, it's a huge scale increase. Uh, I'm talking specifically about industry people, uh, uh, not necessarily indies. Uh, they tend to, you know, follow their own rules on that regard. So the next question is, uh, traditional wisdom dictates that a fun gray box level almost always works out when well polished. Uh, that That's sort of true. Uh, have you ever seen game mechanics that require good artwork to convey the fun? I ask because poor visuals usually spoil my enjoyment of any prototype I build. Uh, yeah, it's, so you would think, in theory, that if it was fun with cubes, uh, or, or that, you would think that, that you could make it fun with just cubes. And for a lot of things you can, but you're right, there are certain things that that doesn't work for. Uh, a good example would be, we did a uh, arena in Ratchet 3 called Annihilation Nation. And the first time we presented this level to user testing uh, to see whether it was too hard or too, uh, uh, too easy and stuff like that, we knew that it wasn't going to get rated very well because we were actually testing a white box, you know, a just grid cube sort of level. And uh, we knew that the first pieces of criticism we were going to get was, this feels kind of unfinished. Uh, you know, I I think maybe if it was if it looked nice, you know, you you expect to get that, but you still do get good feedback underneath, right? Just not by hearing what they're saying, just by watching them. Uh, so the uh, there's also uh, you as a designer, you have to learn when you're presenting your work to a stakeholder, like say someone who's giving you the money for the game or uh, your boss, you know, design director, that sort of thing, when you're presenting it to them, you have to take into account what kind of communicator they are. Some people are really, really good at communicating in ideas and concepts. 
they really like to read documents. I find that uh, the majority of people I communicate with documents tend to be programmery types or producery types. They really like to see how the ideas work next to each other. Um, but there's a far larger group of people who communicate visually, who, who uh, really kind of understand something when it comes to them on an experiential level as opposed to an intellectual level. I've heard somewhere that something like 80% of people are that kind of visual, instinctual sort of person, and maybe 20% are the, the conceptual kind. So when you're the conceptual kind and you make a white box level and you think to yourself, yeah, this is fucking rad, right? There's going to be you know, uh, four other people on your team who aren't going to be able to get it from that. So what we end up doing a lot of the times is, is you make your white box level so that you think it's fun, and then when it's time to present it to someone on the outside, you spend that extra amount of time working on theatrics. And if you're the type of person who needs the theatrics and stuff to, to know it's fun, you definitely should be doing that for yourself. Uh, but uh, it's very easy to get stuck in over polishing these very early phase designs. So if you're that type of person, and I'm not, so I'm not sure how to, to handle this, but if you're that type of person and you need to create that way, try to find some way to set limits on how much time you're spending on the polishing of these things. Because I think, uh, like if you look at Mark Cerny's method talk from, from Dice, he would say that uh, about the time it takes you to make two pretty good, pretty polished examples of what your game is, the whole rest of your game is going to be made in approximately that same amount of time, right? So you need to understand that the more effort it takes to make something in those early phases, the harder it's going to be for you to sort of catch up to that later on if you spend all your time polishing just that one thing. Uh, I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to clear it up later if, if that was confusing. Um, I think the other thing about that uh, that's the sort of the nugget of that question is uh, there's a lot of conventional wisdom and for good reason that says that uh, you should start with a mechanic just with cubes and iterate on that until you get something that's fun that way and then move on to uh, uh, sort of sort of iterating on that and making it bigger and bigger and that is a definitely a way that people create things um, the the what I was trying to say before is mainly not whether or not it's better to create that way for you but if you're going to be showing it to a stakeholder the chances are you should assume that that person is a visual intuitive type communicator and you should do whatever you can with the time that you have allotted to to, to make that for them so for example, in Ratchet and Clank, when I would design a level uh, in, in gray box to show to artists, it would look very different than the gray box I would show to other designers. Uh, for example, if it was going to be a factory, I would take some cylinders and run them along the ceiling so they would look like pipes, you know? Or I would have, uh, if, if there was supposed to be a cityscape in the distance, I would put a bunch of cubes so that it, you could kind of tell it was going to be a city. You know, if there had to be a water plane, I would put a blue uh, plane there, you know, and all of that, it, it, it isn't necessarily working, but it's going further towards helping those visual intuitive type people understand what your, your, uh, what your intention is. And as a designer, most of the time, you're not also implementing the things that you're designing, right? Uh, as I was saying, it's very specialized. Usually you'll come up with a design and then give it to someone to implement. You give it to artists and they will make art. They will give that to the animators who will make animations. Uh, usually there's visual effects artists making visual effects for what you're doing. There's programmers coding behaviors. Sometimes you as the designer are scripting using those behaviors. Uh, occasionally, if you're uh, the type of designer who also can code, you're going to be uh, you know, implementing that sort of stuff. But if you're on a large team, chances are you're going to be designing this to communicate it to someone else. And if that's the case, you're definitely going to have to take into account the fact that these person might be uh, 
the type of people who who can only really understand what you're talking about if they see it and experience it. Uh, let's see. So next question. Um, looks like this will be the last question. Unless uh, anybody out there has more questions, feel free to put them in the questions area. Uh, but the let's see. Over the last few years, we've seen the decline of traditional character action games. For example, Jack, Ratchet, and Sly in favor of more realistic, narrative-focused games. How can the traditional boss battle cycle of difficulty ramping adapt while maintaining realism? So um, the, in 2002-ish, uh, in uh, we started noticing that people didn't really want mascot games as much as they used to. Before that point, games like uh, Mario and uh, uh, you know, games with very colorful, silent heroes that you could fill the role in for, whose general job was running around, jumping and collecting things, that started to taper off. And Jack 1 was sort of the first uh, big title to sort of feel that, right? And we were creating Ratchet 1 while that was going on and seeing that they were struggling when everybody knew from, from video game trends when that was going out, that, that thing was going to be a success because it was a very well done, very highly polished character action game, which was essentially the, you know, it was the Grand Theft Auto of the time. You'd make those and those would be big money. Uh, even the, the bad ones tended to make big money, you know, which was why you saw the, the, the space flooded with so many mascots at that point. I mean, not many people remember, I think it was Bigsby or Bugby. Uh, you know, or, or just a lot of those other uh, uh, mascot characters that created and then never got sequels because Grand Theft Auto came out and all of a sudden the industry realized, oh, people want other games. And it turns out there's a ton of people who want those other games. And so everybody had to try to figure out how to go from making very gamey, very uh, character-filled uh, type games that were uh, where the characters were sort of empty so you could pour your personality and, and, and stuff into them to more story-based games that were anchored in a real-world context. And uh, over the course of that, a lot of people tried a lot of experiments that worked and some that didn't work. And what we saw was uh, largely people abandoning gaming tropes in favor of uh, uh, new tropes that could uh, it could sort of convey that realistic context better than some of the the what they were calling gamey uh, aspects of video games. For example, boss battles, like he was saying, or uh, difficulty ramping, that sort of thing. Um, it wasn't clear how that sort of thing would promote the 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 kind of feeling of being in the real world. So a lot of games would dump it. Um, but I think what we found out was that the same rules applied. You just had to figure out how to fiction them and give them the correct theatrics to exist within the world. That the games were not necessarily different in terms of the underlying principles that, that created them. It was more that they were uh, they were growing up in terms of the kinds of stories they could tell and also the kinds of problems and, and questions that they could ask the player. So uh, that's sort of a long way of saying that generally what ended up changing was just the way things looked and were fictioned and not necessarily all the stuff that was going on under the hood. Um, I did a little bit of work on... Uh, I'm trying to remember what the final name of the game was, Sleeping Dogs, when it was still an Activision title. And one of the things I was, I was talking to them about were ways of taking sort of traditional design principles and fictioning them to be appropriate in a more realistic world. So one of the things I like to talk about a lot uh, is enemy archetypes. If you look at my uh, GDC talk, uh, it's, it's up on the GDC vault. The, you know, I, I, I was pushing that you could, you could come up with a very satisfying combat system, not necessarily the only one, but a very satisfying one, 
by making sure that the player could understand at least four different styles of enemy, right? I called them archetypes. So there was the, the heavy enemy, and the heavy enemy was sort of high damage, high hit points. Uh, he was someone you needed to, to take into consideration, right? Then there was the, uh, the enemy that could hit you from a distance, the, the far enemy. There was the near enemy. They had to be close to you to damage them. And then the swarmer, who was the opposite of the heavy in that they did the least amount of damage and uh, uh, took the least amount of hits to kill, right? So if you think of those archetypes and then you think of uh, level design archetypes like what we used in Ratchet would be uh, anytime we had a horizontal separator between you and an enemy, we called it a gap, right? So it could be a void or a lava pit. It's basically you can't walk across it. It blocks movement but not your attacks necessarily. We had uh, cover, which was sort of vertical blockers of horizontal attacks. And then we had uh, ledges where an enemy would be standing up here and firing at you down here. And your challenge was either to get up to where the enemy was or to use an attack that could lob something up at the enemy. And uh, in explaining sort of how these things worked, a lot of times what, uh, what questions people would ask is, is sort of how do we do ledges and those types of enemies and gaps and, and make that not feel like something that can't exist in the real world. And so some examples I was giving was, let's say you're making a, a shooter, right? And uh, it's in the real world and you need to put the enemy on the other side of a gap. Well, you put them on the other side of a street, right? That's a horizontal separator. There's cars going. It's kind of dangerous to be in that zone. It still counts as a gap, you know, or, uh, you know, if you're on the roofs of buildings, it's very easy to get a gap at that point. Uh, you know, a ledge, if they're standing on a table, that's a ledge because now the player has to change their, their aiming if that's part of the game, right? You can put them on balconies, right? The player could collapse the balcony maybe. And now, you know, since there was no way to get up there, you, you've still made it so the player has an alternate way of approaching it. So it's sort of taking these really old design principles that we learned in those old school platformers and giving them a fresh coat of paint and really thinking through why they work the way they do so that we can uh, to make them contextually appropriate for uh, a more realistic game. Uh, I ran up against this pretty hard in, um, in Resistance. I was working on the multiplayer of that. Uh, I did the multiplayer design. And uh, what we ran into was uh, uh, we, because it was sort of realistic, more realistic at least than a ratchet game, uh, I couldn't use some tools that I normally had in my toolbox, right? Like I couldn't put a platform that just sat there that had a rocket underneath it that would just lift you up somewhere. Uh, if, if I were designing something that needed that, I would have to design the whole area so that it could contain an elevator that would be physically anchored to something, right? Because that was our idiom, was everything was physical. Um, when we went to multiplayer and we needed something like a jump pad, the physical didn't make as much sense. And so we were able, because it was multiplayer and the idea was already a little less uh, real worldy, we were able to, to take a step further and say, okay, we have large columns of air that you can walk into and that will blow you up to the next area that we could use as jump pads because just sort of coming onto a thing that went boing was a little too uh, cartoony. You know, it, well, it didn't fit in the, the medium, but because at least the, uh, the multiplayer part was uh, less, uh, less realistic by its very nature of having 40 people just constantly fighting and respawning, we were able to do things that were a bit more gamey. So often you can kind of poke and prod your uh, your context, your world, and your, your your story and everything, and see where you can get some leeway out of that to include sort of the more traditional stuff. Um, boss battles were something I remember in in Resistance One at least. We had a big debate on whether or not there should be boss battles, on whether or not that would be too unbelievable. Uh, and what we what we eventually settled on was the idea at least for Resistance 1, of the what we called a climactic end encounter. So it would be more like a um, the final encounter in Resistance 1 was a giant 
uh, reactor with enemies all around it of different sizes and shapes that would come in in different combinations. And you were progressing through this end boss by beating you know, its vulnerability points, which were coolant towers or whatever, and then moving to the next area where we would do another sort of set piece. So it was, at least the idea behind it was we're taking what we know about boss battle design, right? You take these uh, layers where the boss adds on capabilities and we, we fictioned that boss as an entire space, as a room, a puzzle sort of, uh, a combat puzzle you could fight your way to the end of. And then we could have the same sort of pacing and uh, emotional milestones that, that you could in a traditional boss battle but it wouldn't feel like, oh man, he just pretended to die and then crashed through the wall, you know, which wouldn't really fit with uh, sort of a hardcore, you know, realistic type thing. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, let's see if there's any more. Um, okay, it looks like that's it for now. So I'm just going to cut it short. Uh, I, I had a good time doing this. I think what I'll do next time is I'll put the... Uh, uh, I'll put this, this invitation up a lot earlier, and then people can come in and leave their questions uh, like Nikhil did so that I could, I could answer them on the air. Even if people aren't watching it live, then they can go see it on YouTube afterwards, and that'll be uh, hopefully, hopefully entertaining. Uh, so I hope this worked out. Uh, I hope you guys like this, and please leave me some comments either on YouTube or in the Patreon uh, uh, pages letting me know what you thought, and if there's anything you'd like me to change about the format, or uh, like if anybody had any technical problems getting into this, uh, please let me know, and I'm gonna try to solve that uh, for when we do this next month. Uh, the next thing that's coming up is next Saturday, I'm going to do an Ask Me Anything for my uh, 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 Patreon group, and uh, I'm going to be posting on the Patreon uh, pages how you can access that. Basically what it'll be is kind of like an internet forum where you, uh, I'll, I, I leave it open for a certain amount of time and you can post questions and I'll uh, sort of answer those questions like an ask me anything on Reddit. The difference is I'll only have it open for, uh, instead of, sorry, the difference is that uh, uh, normally in a Reddit, you know, uh, they're asking questions, the person's there the whole time, right? I'm going to do this more passively, like a forum conversation, where uh, I'm going to leave it open for a longer period of time and then go into it on certain days and answer a bunch of questions all at once. So uh, if that doesn't make any sense, I'll post more about it uh, in the coming weeks, uh, weeks, in the coming days to the Patreon page, and then um, hopefully you guys get an idea of what that is. So uh, thanks again, and I'll see you next month for another... Patreon chat.